Well, I'd like to share some thoughts with you today about gratitude. Not as a way of saying thank you more often, because I'm assuming you're all well versed in that already. Um, or even more sincerely, or even more graciously, um, I'm not even wanting to dwell just on receiving with greater gratitude, though I will speak about that. But I really want to invite you to a vision of life that is growing from a foundation of gratitude. That is, that gratitude, rather than being a whole series of individual acts, is really the ground of your being, the way of living, the way of being mindful of all that you have and generous in your appreciation of all that others have and can give. It's a profoundly enriching way to live. And in fact, without it, no matter what we have on the outside, we remain impoverished. Gratitude is one of the greatest gifts that we could have. And maybe the challenge within it is to live as a grateful person, <coughs> to live focusing on what we can be grateful about, even in the more difficult times of our lives. There's a um, rather well-known little phrase from the 18th century poet William Cooper which says, God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. And sometimes those ways, God's or life's, are extremely mysterious and it's very hard at those times to summon up a little bit of gratitude. But even beginning from the, from the realization that we can meet those difficulties, and what's more, that we meet them guided by sublime teachings, and what's more, that we meet them alongside one another, and with the power of prayer, and meditation, and spiritual realization, all working for us. We have so much to be grateful for, because this is really a spiritual invitation, even more than it is a psychological one, that we would live from a place of gratitude and train our fickle minds to notice much more intensely and much more openly what we have rather than what we don't have. Some of you will know that our Buddhist brothers and sisters have a great lesson for us in this, in as much as it's very central in their praying and in their training of the mind to give explicit thanks, not only for the gift of this human existence, but also for the gift that we have this human existence at a time and in a place where we can open to the great teachings of wisdom, the great teachings of compassion, the teachings of love, the teachings of forgiveness, the teachings of rejoicing and the teachings of hope. We have so much to be grateful for and in this place we can receive those teachings with a sense of unconditional entitlement, free from dogma and free from exclusion. This is a profound thing. We don't have to deserve them. We don't have to belong to any particular group. We already belong to the human and divine family and it is as members of that family that we hear these messages of hope and that we can receive them with gratitude and that we can allow that gratitude to enfold us and cherish us so that we can enfold and cherish the world in which we live. Sometimes it is oddly difficult 
even for those of us who had been thinking about these things for a long time, also to receive with gratitude. Sometimes it's much easier to give than it is to receive. And thinking about that, I was given the gift just a day or so ago of a, of a story from one of the people who was at the Easter retreat. And I know that several of the people who are at the Easter retreat are here today. So they will be particularly touched to hear this story. And I'm just going to read you a sentence or two before, uh, um, to, to put it in a little context. This man, Mark, who's in his probably early 40s, wrote to me, you may recall that my issue was that I can block out messages of love that come my way. Well, many of us block out messages of love. We say to ourselves, oh, they don't mean it, or oh, if they knew what I was really like, they wouldn't say it, or oh, they probably say it to everybody, or, or we feel defensive, or they didn't say it in exactly the right way, or there are all sorts of ways in which we can deflect messages of love. So, he writes, I have experienced that twice in the two weeks since we were together, a different experience of gratitude. The first was, someone exp expressed condolences and genuine concern for the loss of my aunt. I sort of shrugged and mumbled a thanks, as the person involved was not my aunt, but my partner's friend's mother. I went back to this guy later, says Mark, and expressed my gratitude for his concern, that I was working on being more accepting, and that rather, respond, rather than respond to his concern, I had evaluated his words and determined that his facts were not quite right. <laughs> and isn't that something we could all do? And isn't it a marvel that he recognized what he was doing? I then, of course, he goes on to say, determined that I would repeat my appreciation and my gratitude because appreciation and gratitude are really hand in hand because the facts were not important the experience of appreciation the experience of gratitude was what was extremely important because until we are filled up until we have received our gratitude to others will always be conditional. So back to Mark's story. With this same person, who is obviously a great old spiritual teacher for him, with this same person, when we were parting a few days later, I expressed my appreciation for him as a gentle and kind soul whose wisdom I appreciated. He said, and you too. Isn't that lovely? And you too, meaning the gratitude was reciprocated. I shrugged. And again, can't we all see ourselves shrugging, you know, not letting it rest on our shoulders. As I didn't feel those qualities applied to me. Again, an evaluation of the expression of love, a deflection in fact. He pulled me up on that and reminded me to accept that compliment as it was intended and genuine. I want you really to think about that. I want you to think about the giving and the receiving of appreciation as part of your spiritual practice. And I want you to think about how this arises, how this arises and how this is nourished through the simple but often forgotten act of valuing our own lives, respecting our own gift of life so that we can offer it much more freely to others, so that we can value what we have to give. I am the vine said one of our greatest, most sublime teachers. I am the vine, <coughs> said Jesus, and you are the branches. In other words, we call on the same divine source 
to express in our very everyday lives these beautiful qualities, including gratitude. Thank you for this gift of life. Thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for your kindnesses to one another. Thank you for the music. Thank you for the poetry. And thank you also for reminding each other that we can rise again when we fall. For all that, thank you. I also found a very beautiful teaching from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, which I posted on Facebook to remind the many people who can't be present with us of all that we can learn from the situations that we are not immediately grateful for. And when I think about my own long life, I could say with a great deal of confidence that some of the situations that I most welcomed, I have entirely forgotten. And some of the situations which I had wished so sincerely that they had not come my way, I actually have much to value from them, much to learn from them, and much to be grateful for. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross expresses something like this. The most beautiful people we have known, she says, are those who have experienced defeat, suffering, struggle, and loss, as we all have. There is not a single person in this church, here today, or listening to this talk when it's posted on YouTube, not a single person who escapes the inevitability of struggle and loss, grief and disappointment. And yet, something calls us still to be grateful for life in a truly unconditional way. Those people, says Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with gentleness. It softens their edges, in other words. And that brings them a deep, loving concern. Beautiful people, she finishes up with, do not just happen. They happen because things happen to them, as they happen to you and they happen to me. And then those people reflect upon the events within a cradle, within a context, within an appreciation of love and comfort for which we can individually and collectively be immensely grateful. How would we wake up to a new day without calling upon these teachings, these prayers, these shared experiences, this nourishment of leaning together of learning together, of forgiving one another for our foibles and trusting that others are also able and willing to forgive us for our foibles. All of this grows and grows exponentially when you become an instrument of and an ambassador for not only gratitude, but also appreciation. Speaking up your appreciation, noticing what you can appreciate, and dwelling on that. We live in a culture of complaint, dissatisfaction, and cynicism. So it takes courage to be a person who is explicitly appreciative but the rewards are immense. You become much easier to be around. You become even easier to love. Life itself becomes more lovable. Life itself becomes more hopeful. 
when you can receive others' appreciation and offer it as a very natural thing, and some of you will need to make more effort with this than others, but those of you who need to make more effort will often do it very, very beautifully because you are doing it consciously and because you are changing old habits for new and more beautiful ones. Towards the end of our service today, we're going to be singing a particularly wonderful prayer. And I want to finish with this because in a very real way, this prayer for me encapsulates that when we see the world, when we see ourselves, when we see one another through a vision or through a prism or through eyes that we could call eyes of the sacred, eyes of holiness, or even through the divine vision of unconditional compassion, then everything changes. Then gratitude, the giving, and the receiving becomes the most natural thing that we could possibly express. So this is a beautiful prayer. And it comes from the 15th century, so the word that is used at the beginning of this over and over is God. It could as easily be my divine source, my beloved, holiness itself. God, be in my head and in my understanding. God, be in my eyes and in my looking. God, be in my mouth and in my speaking. God, be in my heart and in my thinking. God, be at mine end and my departing. Blessed be.